I'm Kaylee Kreider. I'll be your moderator for the next panel. I'm here to introduce three amazing people. Uh, first of all, uh, to my immediate left is Mark Brownstein, who's the Senior Vice President for Energy at the Environmental Defense Fund, where he leads the energy program with a focus on halting oil and gas emissions um, and putting us on a path consistent with 2050 zero carbon future. I learned in putting together his bio that he's an adjunct professor at New York University Law School and has taught energy policy at Columbia University's School of International Public Affairs. Um, to in the middle, I'll say that way, is uh, Sarah Smith. She's just joined us from the US. She leads Clean Air Task Force's global team focused on minimizing emissions of so-called super pollutants, which includes methane and black carbon. She serves on the board of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, which is an international partnership of over 70 countries and over 70 non-state actors. She is a 2011 Robert and Patricia Switzer Foundation Fellow. And then to my far left, there's Deborah Gordon, or Debbie Gordon, a senior principal in the Climate Intelligence Program at the Rocky Mountain Institute. She leads the Oil and Gas Solutions Initiative. She's also a senior fellow at the Watson Institute. She re her research has spearheaded the development of the Oil Climate Index, plus gas, OCI plus, a first of its kind analytic tool that compares the life cycle climate impacts of oil and gas resources. I have also learned she has a book coming out called No Standard Oil, which I encourage you all to read. It's newly out just for COP. Yep. So really would like you all to have a chance to see that. So welcome to all of you and all of you who are here in person and watching online. So just first of all, not everyone has gotten to see everything happening at COP today. I'd love for um, you all to just give me the short on the incredible announcements that have led up to today and today uh, here at COP on methane. Sarah? Sure. This is the first ever global political commitment on reducing the potent greenhouse gas methane. And it's an incredible step forward to see more than a country more than 100 countries joining this global effort. It's anchored at the head of state level. We saw presidents and prime ministers standing up and recognizing that reducing methane is the strongest lever we can pull to rapidly and substantially slow the rate of warming right now. And I know that like people were here at the pavilion watching the announcement. It was actually spilling out into the hallway. Um, give us an example of how global this was. Um, obviously, we saw the US, we saw the UK, the European Union, but give us a sense of how global this is and what this could mean. Well, I, you know, I think you, I think you have to start with the US, which of course is the world's largest oil and gas producer. So they have a special responsibility to step up here. But Europe, which is the world's, one of the world's largest consumers of natural gas. So you have a large producer, a large consumer, but you have many very um, important states in the energy system now stepping up as well. Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, Saudi, um, you know, uh, no, I mean, you know, and in fact, 100 countries, I mean, it really, every continent now is engaged in the fight to reduce methane emissions. And we should be clear, that's not just oil and gas, that's also agriculture and landfills. And I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing. Debbie, tell me why oil and gas is a focus, but not the only focus of yeah. the announcement. So very different than CO2, which comes from literally everything that we do in life. Methane comes from basically three sectors and somewhat equal, one third, one third, one third. Oil and gas and coal mines are a third. Um, agriculture is a third and waste, landfills are a third. And the oil and gas sector 
is, I would call it the low hanging fruit. Mm. We've been looking at it for a very long time and the groups, um, the, the strategies are known and that's much of what my book is about. The strategies are on the table. It's just having the will to do something about it. EPA announced that they'll be, or it was announced that EPA will be starting meth, um, landfill regulations for waste sector, which is fantastic and a lot of work to be done also on agriculture. Really interesting. I. You know, you hear you're walking in the hallways or maybe I happen to have the civil society action zone outside my hotel. Um, <laughs> so I hear sometimes that there are some well, people maybe knock pledges and say, well, what about action? And so the focus on this panel is, you know, how do pledges become action? So I'd love to hear from each of you how you think what's been announced today becomes action on the ground. So maybe I'll start at the far end and we'll work toward me just a little bit about how, does, how do these pledges become real? Yeah. Well, the very first thing that a pledge does is you need a baseline because you have to cut it off based on some number, 30% by 2030 of what? And we have not systematically inventoried methane ever in the world. So this is something that's been picking up slowly, all these cops before have been CO2 focused. So that's why what Sarah's saying is so true. This really is historic. And I think beyond solutions, which obviously we will get to in all these sectors, um, just having it in the NDCs, these nationally determined contributions for every country, at least those that have signed on of 107, is going to be incredibly important to create a pathway to action. So interesting, I'm old enough, you know that phrase, I'm old enough to remember. I can remember in Kyoto when we were fighting over the basket of gases that were going to be included. Mm -hmm. And you know, for a long time we've talked about there being a basket of gases, but we've really been so CO2 focused. Um, it's, it's just incredible to see the focus now on methane and super pollutants. And that brings me to you, Sarah. What do you think are, you know, is, could, could really help us focus on actually achieving the reductions that these pledges are promising? Well, what we've seen so far is a setting of ambition. And now we need every country that has joined this pledge to rein in the emissions. And in many cases, that's going to take policy making. We heard earlier today from the Minister of Columbia talking about how his country is moving forward with implementing regulations for the oil and gas sector. That's what we need to see <laughs> in in every single country. Uh, Debbie referenced landfill, landfills as well. We need to see policy making. We saw Canada recently commit to a 75% reduction in their oil and gas methane emissions by 2030, helping to set a standard that other countries should, should match. And Mark, why don't you talk a little bit about this and maybe also talk about how maybe the non-governmental sector or even maybe the corporate sector itself could be helpful in making these pledges real. Well, I, 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 think, it, I think it's ultimately going to come down to three things. So first of all, I think people have to recognize this is a 30% reduction globally by 2030. Every country signing up is making a contribution to achieving that global goal. And so what we can expect to see is some countries will likely do more and maybe need to do more. Some countries may do less than 30%, but the total has to add up to 30. So that's number one. And I think every country is gonna be on a different path. And this is very much in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, right? Differentiated commitments all working towards a common purpose. So in many respects, this is gonna work a lot like the Paris Agreement itself. Companies, uh, countries make the commitment sign up to the commitment, and now it's up to them to put together the action plans that show how they're going to meet that commitment. I would hope that by the time we get to COP27, maybe a COP27 will be sitting here having a conversation about the action plans and the adequacy of those plans and the data underlying those plans. So, so this is not a one and done. I think methane is going to be a common feature of the COPs now going forward. So that's, that's number two. Number three is, is that when met, where methane is concerned, we're very fortunate in that we have a whole universe, and this is a little bit of a pun, but we have a whole universe of satellites <laughs> and other technologies now that are coming online, some by uh, government space agencies like the European Space Agency, some by uh, non-governmental actors like ourselves with methane sat, others in the commercial sphere, but there's a whole array 
of technologies coming into, the, into being over the next couple of years that will give us a lot of information about exactly where we are in terms of methane emissions in the atmosphere, but as importantly, you know, enough granularity that we can actually track how well countries and companies are doing in making reductions. And, and I, I choose those words carefully because I do think that when it comes to many of the countries around the world, um, you know, many of them have national oil companies who themselves are major emitters as a result of the, the oil and gas they produce. And so we're going to need those companies engaged as well as the countries to really get a full handle on this. Debbie, why don't you talk a little bit more about some of these approaches to kind of track emissions. Um, I know that um, Rocky Mountain Institute does some work in this area too. Why don't you talk a little bit more about this ecosystem of approaches to try to track emissions? Yeah, I mean, I really think this is the right moment to be have had a pledge with the satellites going up. And as Mark said, public, private, and the only public-private nonprofit partnership Carbon Mapper, which is the satellite system that we're involved in, is NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, Car the California Air Resources Board, Planet, Carbon Mapper is heading at the NGO and RMI. And so you get this, um, the world is going to have lots of different opportunities to see these emissions. And these satellites do, together they create a system. I think of it as like knitting a sweater. And what we're going to get really smart at is understanding which satellite is seeing what within its best capability all over the world. So really there won't be any blind spots. It's truly going to make the invisible visible. And that's going to be a, a game changer here. Now Carbon Mapper, the NASA the scientists have broken through being able to see methane over water. That's been a problem up until now because the water reflects and the satellite can't see the emissions. But they're coming in at an angle to use the water to their benefit, at glint mode they call it. And so now we're seeing methane over water. I mean, these are some of the smartest people in the room to do this job. So Debbie, Debbie uses the analogy of a sweater. I almost think of it like a jigsaw puzzle, right? So each one of these technologies gives us a piece. And I don't know if people caught it during the announcement, uh, the president of the European Union talked about IMEO, the International Methane Emissions Observatory. So that's a new project under the auspices of the UN Environmental Program. And what IMEO is intended to do is assemble all the puzzle pieces so that you get a clear picture. And that's why that project is so incredibly important. But you know, go back to your earlier question, that's why I'm so confident that these pledges will add up to real action because we'll be assembling those puzzle pieces and we'll be able to see that picture. It's either going to be a really good picture or it's going to be a meh picture <laughs> or it could be a terrible picture, but we'll know. And that's new for the world of climate policy and climate politics. Well, there have been a number of news stories out in the last couple of months that have shown that we're underestimating yes. methane emissions. Um, I've seen numbers 30% underestimation. Um, and look, this also happened, I'm again old enough to remember the toxic release inventory and um, other tracking efforts where, you know, until we established baselines or until we, um, I remember the carbon disclosure project, right? But until we started actually trying to track emissions, whether it was of toxic chemicals or CO2 and now methane, we really didn't know what we didn't know. Now we're starting to learn things and finding out we're under accounting. Um, and I'm curious, Sarah, you've got some experience. Um, it, what do you think, you work with this international partnership, how do you think this is being taken, you know, um, that this, now that this information's coming in, how do you think governments are starting to respond to this? Well, the. The proof is in the surging concentrations of methane in the atmosphere, right? There's no, there's no question about the overall magnitude of the emissions and the fact that they're rising. So the ecosystem that's been discussed about the satellites is, is really going to be revolutionary. And I think countries are stepping up and taking notice and that's part of why you're seeing so many participate in the launch of the Global Methane Pledge today. There are other facets of the methane ecosystem too, including civil society organizations like ours here today, that can also help countries with policy and technical support mm -hmm. as they start to take those necessary steps to, to lower their emissions and, and supporting companies as well. So let's talk about the companies a little bit because 
I guess I've been a little bit surprised by the interest we've seen um, <laughs> from the oil and gas sector, um, even from some of the farm groups who, which have expressed some interest actually in tracking emissions and in seeing what they could do to reduce emissions and in crediting systems. I'm just interested in each of your perspectives because you all talk to different, you know, cohorts within different um, countries. Tell me a little bit about why there is interest in this space, how you think that might be changing the politics and why it might lead to these pledges becoming reality. So when I start down with you and move, move down the, the, the so road. This is a really competitive space, as we know. And especially as we work to get off oil and gas, it's going to become more competitive because you're going to have fewer barrels produced by still so many companies and countries. So what's happening is methane, which is a byproduct of oil production and isn't in its own right a producible commodity, is a saleable, it's not really a waste product, it's actually an energy source. So the idea of bringing companies into this, competing over who has the lowest methane, it's a bit of a race to the top. RMI has developed and is, and I'm seeing this in real life, like we're, we have an, what we call the MIQ standard, the methane intelligence quotient, and it's a competitive low methane gas certification, third party certification that grades the gas. We just had 150 buyers and sellers at a workshop. There's a lot of interest in buyers saying to gas and oil producers and shippers, um, processors, that they want A-grade gas. They want lower methane gas. So I think that the industry is reading the writing on the wall. If, if the policymakers are there and they're competitive, it's almost like the deal is done. It's really interesting. Sarah, what are you thinking? Or it's kind of helping to bring some of these you know, parties to the table. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Debbie's right. The policymakers are starting to move. We, we work actively in the European Union where import standards for natural gas, for example, are starting to be discussed. And that could have global repercussions, right? So, so many different countries supply gas into the EU market, including the US, Algeria, Cutter, and many other countries, some of which are starting to develop standards and some of which haven't yet, but certainly could. And this sort of scheme could play out in other sectors as well, in terms of agricultural products where countries and companies that start to take action to lower their methane intensity could have a comparative advantage when selling into the global market. And the EU's working on their standards, I mean, just in the next year or two, right? So this is this is imminent. No, oh, we heard we heard standards we heard standards uh, being proposed within the next month or two. I mean we heard that well that's we right. That today. That's right. And Sarah's right. I mean I don't think the European Union is quite there yet, but this is an active part of is an active part of the conversation. Uh, I, I think we're rapidly going to move from a world where people pay a premium for green gas to a world where people are going to pay a penalty, mm -hmm. you know, either in terms of fi financial penalty or just simply restrictions on what markets they can go to if they're not meeting what we would consider to be basic standards. I mean, let's really be clear here, right? What we're talking about is, is we're talking about unnecessary pollution associated with the development and use of oil and gas. And while we all are committed to reducing dependence on oil and gas, that is also very much on the agenda, we need to make sure that as we make that transition, we're not incurring unnecessary pollution. And so that's really where the focus needs to be. I think a number of countries and companies are beginning to get a sense of that. I was privileged to participate in ASEAN um, workshop on methane uh, just a week ago in which the CEO of Petronas, which is the national oil company in Malaysia, talked very passionately about the need to address methane emissions. And I think from his perspective, this is very much about um, the quality of the product that they're selling, um, their sense of responsibility, um, but also their belief um, that when they're doing the right thing by the environment, they're also making their operations more efficient. And for a number of these national oil companies, that's important. They're charged with making sure that they use the national resource efficiently. Do we think that first movers, the BPs, the shells, the, you know, will get credit for that early action? Um, you know, whether 
that's going to be halo to their brand with consumers or um, actual credits or how, you know, do they, how will that accrue to them for, for, for those that, that move early and, and try to do the right thing? Well, I would say that, that it, it really is about, you know, what, what Debbie was saying, you know, as countries begin to transition away from oil and gas dependence, it very much is going to be a buyer's market. And so I look at what, you know, BP and Shell and others are doing is basically making sure that they still have access to those markets for however long those markets exist. And that's really, I think, what's motivating them. And in turn, it's what's motivating them to talk to their national oil company partners about the necessity of being part of the solution. Oh, I was just going to say, I, there was just in the paper the other day a headline from Cut Her Gas saying all of these carbon-free, um, carbon-neutral LNG shipments are bunk unless you prove it. So you're starting to see national oil companies and certainly there's been a lot of work with Shell, BP and others on flaring emission reductions for years now with the World Bank and the satellites also that are picking up flaring around the world. I think it's a bit of a race to the top. I really think that if, if we have a smaller oil and gas sector at the end of the day, who remains standing? That's the question. Who's at the table here? This isn't necessarily going to be a growing sector into the future. It's going to be a shrinking sector when it comes to oil and gas. And hopefully the same with waste. You know, as we do more to reduce, we follow along the footsteps of what we learn with oil and gas and also do that in waste as well. I've been thinking about satellite technology and I do think that being able to see flaring from space has made a difference to the consumer, right? When you can actually see pollution from space, it does have an impact in, like someone said in real life, IRL, right? When, when you actually see that flaring happening now, it does impact people to say, why are companies doing that? Why is that happening in my country, in my some, place? So, some people have suggested that, you know, the way the countries are managing flaring is that they're turning off the flares, so you can no longer see the light at night. Yeah. So the good news is that with the satellites, you'll be able to see the methane emissions associated with turning off those flares. Right, they won't be able to hide. And we're finally now going to close that circle. And so maybe we really now have the tools to really get rid of venting and flaring. All together. Yeah. And, and I was just going to add, what's interesting is a lot of these leaks aren't persistent. There's a lot of intermittent leaks. You know, these systems are organic in a way, you know, things burp and change and maintenance has to happen and things break. And what's great about the satellites is they're not only finding offenders, they're actually helping the industry know what it doesn't know. You know, some of this is in remote locations. You don't even know that what's, you know, something bad is going on. So, you know, with the carbon mapper, um, We've tried to, we, we now contact, I know methane sat will do this too, like you're contacting operators, whether it's a waste operator or an oil and gas producer, and you're saying, did you know you have a really big leak? So it's, it's valuable information. So and Sarah, that's also true for governments. You know, governments don't necessarily have the ability to oversee all these corporate operations everywhere either. If a company can't, imagine what it's like for oil and gas regulators. I mean, they can't discover all these problems either. Right. I, I think that we definitely need requirements wherever possible for companies to go out and find and fix their leaks. And that combined with the satellite technology quickly finding or more quickly finding those big plumes is really going to help. So we've spent a lot of time on oil and gas, which is the low hanging fruit. And, um, you know, I I would love to take a little bit of time on, on agriculture. I happen to live on a farm, so I have a personal yeah. interest in that. But uh, agriculture and landfills, because I, you know, it could be that the oil and gas piece, we were talking about, maybe we'll be talking about this in Sharm El Sheikh next year, and we might find ourselves seeing the oil and gas piece moving along at a clip. What do we need to be thinking about now in terms of agriculture? Let's just kind of do a thought experiment and then we'll do the same one on landfills. But let's start with agriculture. What are the things we could be doing now to start to advance that, recognizing that it is more multiple point source and obviously, unlike oil and gas, less identifiable in terms of the, the companies. But, but what could we start thinking about now? I'm going to start in the middle, I'll come this way. So sure. you, you want to be put on? I would say there's two buckets. Yep. First of all, there are a set of fairly well understood solutions for the agricultural sector, like 
biogas digesters for larger farms to deal with the methane from their manure that should be implemented at a wide scale as quickly as possible. At the same time, there are some trickier sources like enteric fermentation, cow burps, right? Where there are some promising- Kids are laughing. <laughs> Any child that's walking, watching now is so well, happy that you they, said cow they burps. They were waiting for farts, actually. <laughs> okay, you're right, you're right. Them. But thank you, thank you for doing that. I but appreciate it. The, the farts, one the kid burps. that's watching is happy now. There are several innovative solutions for enteric, ranging from selective breeding to increase the productivity per animal, to cutting the methanogenesis from the animal, better feed quality, and some new feed additives. I think we need a research agenda to study this whole suite of solutions for this massive source of methane, enteric, and ensure that we're ready by 2030 to actually deliver deep cuts because we can't keep 1.5 in reach without also addressing agriculture. Could not agree more. All right, Mark. Yeah, no, I think this, I, I, so just to build on that, I mean, you know, we, we've been at the issue of methane and particularly oil and gas methane for the better part of, for all, over a decade at this point. Okay, and so 10 years ago, we didn't understand a whole lot about how much emissions we had, or where they were coming from, or who were most responsible, or the technologies that could be used. Right? What we know today, okay, is the, is the result of a lot of work. Um, we don't have 10 or 12 years to get a handle on agriculture, and yet where we are with agriculture is kind of worth where we were with oil and gas methane. So we have to do that, but do it mm -hmm. quicker. Yes. Uh, I agree with Sarah, there's a number of things that we know can be very effective. One of the challenges we have with agriculture is, is that the oil and gas industry is, believe it or not, relatively concentrated. You know, when you look at the commitment that the 12 companies of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative made to reduce methane emissions, those 12 companies by themselves represented a third of global production. Those commitments extended to their partnership means over half of global oil and gas production is, would be committed to reducing emissions. You don't have that kind of size and scale in agriculture, even though you have a lot of corporate ag agriculture. So uh, it's not just about methane digesters on the big you know, agro farms in the middle of the United States or in Russia. It's also about um, the rural farms in India uh, and in China and in other parts of the world. And so how do you get these solutions out into a, what is a very distributed and heterogeneous ecosystem. Right? So that's challenge number one. And then there are these technologies about you know, changing feed and feed practices, which really are promising but need further research. So we got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that money becomes available to do some of that. That's exactly what I was going to say. One of the reasons I'm so excited about the pledge is that it's starting to galvanize more finance and more funding so that we can hopefully have this accelerated agenda that Mark's talking about. I agree, we don't have 10 years to figure this out. Yeah, I, was, I can't add that much. They've all said so much about the ag sector, but I do think I want to echo Sarah's idea that we really need a brain trust. Methane is going to have to do what it needs to do to be reduced in a very short time frame. So we don't have the luxury of 30 years like we've had on CO2, and we're still making too slow progress. We're talking about the decisive decade here to really reduce methane. We need the smartest people. We need all the national labs in all of these countries. One of the big risks on the landfill side, I will say, and it's probably just as true on the ag side, that you build these very sophisticated engineered systems in other, in, even in the U.S., but definitely in, um, you know, developing countries. And they need to be tended to. You can't just go and, like, drop money in a country and build a system, manage landfills, engineered managed landfills need to continuously be managed and all of the unmanaged landfill and dumps need to be managed. So we need to really, you know, kind of, no, be there, be present if this is going to happen in a decade. So, so two things, before we leave agriculture, I'll just say one thing there is there's also cultural practice. Yeah. And unlike oil and gas, you know, uh, I, I happen to know this because I live in an agriculture community, right? There's actually a cultural component that I think sometimes the climate community doesn't always recognize so much that we actually have to reach people where they are and help change cultural practice by reaching out to 
local community leaders to help change agricultural practices. And that's not just in the US, right? It's also in India and China and elsewhere. And that's a little different than the oil and gas sector, right? Which is more corporatized um, in many places. Well, and that, and that comes and, back around to the issue too of, of, you know, consuming less beef and consuming less, you know, dairy and animal products. I mean, I've been a vegetarian since 1982. Right, and there's okay. a lot of consumer choice in that, right? Offering options. And but that's not something that is, you know, something that you can just, you know, blithely impose on any individual or any society, right? Different cultures have different relationships to food, and you need to be understand that and be respectful of that. Um, and uh, and so those kinds of solution sets are going to be very culturally contingent and take a long time. It's not it's not like finding and fixing a methane leak. Right, and there's farming practices and community practices and yeah. what all that means. Tell me a little bit more. I'd love to hear, hear more, Debbie, about landfill and maintaining them and, you know, what does that mean? Is, would this involve more jobs? What would this involve, you know, what, what does that actually mean for these landfills in terms of methane emissions? Because yeah. I think not many people can, like, put a visual on, on what it is you're talking about. It's an interesting, it is a great visual, too. I mean, garbage, if you, if you just, you know, Google landfills and look at these landfills around the world, garbage is very organic. It's not that different than what's going on with oil and gas underground, in a way. It's like has a mind of its own. It's bubbling up and digesting and doing its own thing. And the mixture of the organic and the inorganic waste is a really big problem. You know, so more separation of waste less organic waste, more composting. There are, certainly like ag, there are going to be behavioral aspects of really managing landfills. When it comes to the landfill itself, the system as built, the dump site, you end up collecting the gas, basically. So as it digests, as it bubbles up, it's not just going into the atmosphere. You actually cap it or you actually divert it underground and collect it. And you've seen for years there have been waste to energy systems that have been built up around landfill gas. So as not to, not just not to vent it, but actually to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but these systems, like I said, they need to be maintained. And not that different from the oil and gas sector. You know, the oil and gas sector kind of works, but it kind of messes up a lot too, which is the methane problem and things just leak on purpose or you know, by accident. So that engineered system is hard for a lot of countries. We've done work, I think it's in um, Egypt is pretty far along. You know who's the, the gold standard on landfills is Japan. Is that right? Yeah, they just don't have a lot of land. You know, so it's very, it's a wealthy society that dines nicely, that has a lot of, you know, consumerism to it, but they don't have a lot of space. And so they have long been into the best practices for landfills. So there's a lot of following the leaders here. This isn't a brand new effort to be done in any of these sectors for that matter. Interesting. And you know, one of the challenges that I see a lot, Sarah, is that we don't often do a great job of exporting best practice across countries. You know, we put together these pledges, you get 100 countries, and then we underfund the efforts, whether it's through the, through the UN, through UNEP or UNDP, to then help bring those best practices out to other countries that may not have the resources to, to you know, to learn anew. Um, and that's always been interesting to me that we then underfund that effort and, and so we have these bespoke efforts mm. country by country rather than taking some of the best practice and, and spreading, it, spreading it out. Yes, I've seen that too. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the Climate and Clean Air Coalition because it's very well positioned to be that connector in this space of, and sharer of expertise and best practice policy practices, as are frankly all three of our organizations here today. I think we want to make sure that we pull all of the best examples from around the world and don't necessarily reinvent the wheel. But there are going to be differences country to country and we even see that in the oil and gas space. So there will need to be, to some extent, tailored solutions and, and tailored tools. So we probably have time for maybe one or two more rounds before we wrap up. So. Um, tell me, first I'd like to do one example of why you think, what could go wrong? <laughs> and then, right, because things happen. And then give me the reasons why you have, so let's, let's do one thing you think could go wrong. And then I want us to problem solve around why you think we're going to reach 
you know, the methane target, why you think this is going to work. But how, what do you think could go wrong? And then we're going to go through why you think this is absolutely going to happen. So, but what do you think could go wrong? Where do you think the hiccups could happen? Because I always think it's good to kind of go through that mental mapping, right, of where could we stumble and why are, why are we not going to do that? I'm such an optimist. I never think about how things go wrong. I'm so sorry. That's just such a foreign question for me to even put in my head. I expect things to go right, even <laughs> when they don't. But I do think I was very disappointed. I hope it's okay to say this very publicly, but it's my expectation. I was very disappointed with the IPCC's assessment report working group one. They were great at pulling out methane as an issue, and this is supportive of it, the pledge today, but they very clearly state in this report that how methane is accounted for and, and how policymakers deal with it is a matter of policymaking. The scientific community needs to be all in here at COP. And I think what can go wrong is the dissection or that kind of distance between the policymakers and the politics of this, of COP, and the science and the IPCC. And working group three is coming along, two and three are coming along in the new year, and I'm hoping upon hope that the IPCC actually gives guidance to policymakers on methane to help them support this pledge. Yeah, they have a tough mission, right? Because they can, they can inform they have a they have kind of a bright red line in their mandate, but but you raise a good point. Uh, two two things, right? One is that um, um, it's the inventories are a little behind where the science is, and we have a lot of work to do to get the inventory process in the IPCC and country by country kind of up to speed on where the data are at in this space. And, you know, sometimes it, that can be arduous going country by country to say like, you're 30% off, you know, um, or company by company, right? And that, that's arduous. And then um, getting all these pieces working together. Um, all right, tough, tough question. You were worried I was going to ask a tough question. You knew I had to. Okay, but you get to go last. All right, so Sarah, where could we, sure. where could we stumble on methane? The biggest stumble would be pitting methane reductions against CO2 reductions mm. and choosing one or the other. We don't have time to do that. We have to move forward a pace on both the long term, longer term and quick decarbonization goals and the 10 year decade of action on methane. It's not an either or, it's a yes and plus plus. Plus plus, that's right. To totally agree with that. And I would add um, that, uh, so, so two things, you know, frankly could, could go wrong, right? One is we all pat ourselves on the back <laughs> for a great day and a great set of commitments and a hundred countries and, you know, we'll all go have a drink in a little bit and celebrate our, 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 our hard work. And then everyone just sort of, you know, exhales and relaxes. And we don't begin to get about the business of making sure that we have strong implementation plans and that we follow through on the institutions necessary to track progress over time, like IMEO, and the technologies that are necessary to feeding that, those sets of institutions, that we fail in the follow-up. So that's, that's the, the first. The second is, is that we don't lose focus. Um, so we need to really keep focus on seizing that low hanging fruit. You heard Tim Gould from IEA say today, we could get a three quarters of this 30% reduction globally by focusing on oil and gas methane emissions and it's all technologies that are available to us today. And at the same time, let's make sure that we continue to invest in developing the strategies that then will get us all the way there with agriculture. But let's not lose focus mm. on how to make the biggest progress the soonest. That could also be a risk. Okay, last question. Why is this going to happen? Tell me why you're so optimistic. I, I, when I met each of you before the panel, you all exuded optimism, and as you know, there are people at COP, some reporters I know, some activists I know, some, you know, who are feeling a little bit down. Um, I actually think that methane is the way we're going to keep the 1.5 target 
um, you know, the well below two target alive. Tell me why you all are so optimistic about the methane, um, the methane pathway. Um, so, mm -hmm. Debbie. Me. <laughs> I Natural think, optimist that you are. I am, I am. I, and it, this will come out of my answer too, because I think for the last, and I've been following these cops forever, but I think for the last 25 years, it's been about damage and it's all been about the damage from CO2 over the long time frame of 100 or 500 years, methane changes the conversation entirely. It's about the benefit to the climate of avoiding methane because methane is 120 times more powerful than CO2 the minute it is emitted. And even after 10 years, in which is its lifetime, it's 100 times. Now, no one uses that multiplier, but it's, it's much more than even the 80 that we talk about. So the idea of shifting the focus to how we can benefit the climate, I think changes the conversation. It's, we're kind of off the, you know, this, the ruler and the slapping part, and we're back to let's do good. And it's so near term, right? Yeah. It's kind of like within the frame of reference of most people that it's going to make have benefits. And we're going to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah, optimism. You, you nailed it, Debbie, and I'm a fellow optimist. I would, I would add that there are multiple benefits to tackling methane, and I think that will just buoy the effort further from air quality improvements, right? Methane itself is an ozone precursor. That ozone is toxic to our lungs, toxic to plants. Reducing methane is a job creator reduces waste. So a lot of reasons for moving forward. But ultimately, my biggest reason for optimism is the people that are part of this methane community, right, are brilliant and hardworking and collaborators. So I just can't help think we're going to drive down these emissions. Mark. Well, the only thing that I can add to those two excellent answers is just the simple fact that um, I have a 23-year-old son 21-year-old daughter, and they really believe that we are headed for disaster, that we are screwed. Uh, and they see the fundamental unfairness of a world that's being, a, a, such a damaged world that's being handed to them. And it's hard to argue, right? We've all seen the wildfires, we've seen this, the storms, we've seen the the, the floods, all of those phenomena are being fed by an accelerating rate of warming. So it's bad and it's getting worse. The thing that I am most um, energized about is that with, by reducing methane, we have the opportunity to actually make a difference in our lifetimes, right? And, and what I hope is that through this work, that we can offer hope to those to the, those generation of kids, my kids, um, that something can be done and something meaningful can be done, and we can have an impact now. And I truly believe that when people realize that we have that kind of power in our hands, mm -hmm. this issue is unstoppable, and we will win it. Is that the hashtag mark in our lifetime? <laughs> in our lifetimes. Well, I just want to say, first of all, what a joy for me to have the chance to see all of you. Mark Brownstein, Deborah Gordon, Sarah Smith, you all have been amazing panelists. The work that each of you all are doing, Clean Air Task Force, EDF, Rocky Mountain Institute, so rich and deep. Three of the great groups that are part of the pavilion here. I want to encourage all of you to keep tuning in and coming here in real life to see the programming here at the Methane Moment Pavilion. Um, and thank you for enduring some jet lag to be here on the panel. Um, Sarah, I know that can be very rough. Um, also, please make sure to get the new book. Sorry, I had to do that for you. I know I've worked on a few books with folks and I know how much work that takes. And thank you all for coming and please come and stay afterward and um, ask some questions from our panelists. Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. And thank you for joining thank you, us. Thanks, Thanks to our panelists.